Hello guys, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Palanepan Manikam. Uh, in this video, we are going to talk about COVID in kids again. And we have one of our, my favorite friend, favorite pediatrician, Dr. Kono. <laughs> he's working in our hospital and he's a pediatrician for three kids. My older son, my younger son, and for me as well. That's right. Right. <laughs> a lot of work. A lot of work. <laughs> Um, so as we know, we want to know more about uh, COVID and kids, especially with this Omicron variant. I just wanted to re-emphasize the requirement of vaccination and what uh, does a pediatrician actually think. I don't want you to listen from me all the time. So I wanted to get a real trusted source. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Danton. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Super. Perfect. 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 So let's start with what has been your experience with COVID infection in kids in general? How have you been seeing them? So we're still getting a lot and we've been having them come through um, for, you know, the last year and a half now. We're testing dozens and dozens of kids every day. Um, we are having quite a few positives each week uh, and it kind of waxes and wanes, um, but there's still a lot. Um, thankfully, most of the kids that we've been seeing, they're just kind of the regular COVID where they're cold type symptoms, fever, uh, the usual thing. They generally recover very well. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had personally any of our patients um, who have been super sick. Uh, I mm -hmm. think we had one or two that were hospitalized at some point, but they recovered fine. Uh, Got but, it. Uh, for the most part, it's mild illness. Mild. Okay, good. Good. That's good news. Um, in your experience or in your uh, clean, other doctor's experience, yes. what, what will you say the probability of the severe complication multi-inflammatory system in children, MISC? Yeah, so thankfully, we have not had any patients with that uh, here in our office, and there are six pediatricians in our office. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very rare uh, complication, mm -hmm. um, it, but it's certainly scary. Um, mm -hmm. So when the report started coming out last year about it, you know, that was very concerning for all of us, but we've, we've thankfully never, never seen it because um, mm -hmm. those kids are very sick. Very sick, very sick. I have seen a, a patient uh, uh, personally as well because I've been involved with COVID awareness. One yes. of the uh, distant relatives somehow reached out to me and the patient was admitted in ICU, but uh, he got better with steroids. So. Yeah, it's an interesting um, disease process. It does look like uh, something that we do see um, that we've seen for years called Kawasaki disease. And it's treated mm -hmm. very similarly, right? They get IVIG. Right. Um, and it's kind of this multi-system, super high inflammatory marker process. Mm -hmm. um, so it is looks so similar to um, Kawasaki's. It's different, but it does look similar. Um, and yeah. it'll be interesting to kind of see over the years once we figure out a little bit more about this. Um, disease process. Nice, nice. So, you know, as you said, majority of the kids do well. In yes. your experience, is there any category between like 5 to 10, 10 to 15, which one do worse compared to younger ones? Generally, the kids, the younger the kids, the better they do. So mm. we've had some pretty, um, you know, fairly mild illness for most of them. Some of our teenagers um, generally do pretty well, but we've had some that were sick for quite a while. I mean, like it mm. took them weeks and weeks to get better. Um, not so sick that they had to be in the hospital, at least for our patients, um, but they are at risk. And there are some risk factors um, for more severe disease. Mm -hmm. um, some of our teenagers with, that are a little overweight, um, they're at higher risk of getting complications and respiratory problems with COVID. So mm -hmm. there are some significant risks for some of our teenagers, which usually they don't get super sick. So that right. is concerning as well. Right. And no antibiotics for the disease at all, just supportive therapy. Correct. This is a viral illness. Um, antibiotics are for bacteria, and so it doesn't help. Uh, although sometimes you'll get kids that start with a virus like COVID, so they have respiratory stuff and you can develop into an ear infection, they can develop pneumonia. And sometimes those cases, if you have those secondary problems, they are treated with antibiotics. Got it. Okay. So I'm pretty sure you're happy about the vaccine availability for the kids. Yes. <laughs> Tell me more about it and how are you vaccinating your kids? I mean, so, your kids. Um, our, our kids, you know, now that it's been approved down to five years old, we're really excited about that um, because everybody wants life to get back to normal. We just mm -hmm. want the kids to go to school. We just want to, can we just go back to where we were? So it was so much nicer. <laughs> um, and not have to worry about play dates and birthday parties and like mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So this is a very powerful tool that we now have to help um, decrease that risk. It's not zero, but it definitely decreases the risk. 
we do have a lot of people who ask like, well, if they're like you just talked about, like their disease is generally mild. Why do we have to do this? Like, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to prevent colds. Like, no. it's not hurt mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, but the virus is not completely benign, even in children. So we have had several hundred deaths in the United States, uh, younger kids, teenagers that were previously healthy. So it's not a zero risk. Mm -hmm. um, and then they are also the kids are those vectors, right? So if your five-year-old gets it, the chance of somebody else in the house getting it are pretty high. Hi, hi. And a five-year-old gets it and who's taken care of by grandma. Well, even if grandma's gotten her vaccine, she's still at some risk and she's at risk for getting like super sick. We be a busy. You know, mm -hmm. we to, to get everybody's life back to normal, we need to protect all of these school age kids as well. Got it. Got it. So um, in terms of this vaccine dosage, say the five to 11 years as a pediatric dosage, more than 11 adult dosage, there have been an increase. I've been concerned about that because... I've read some reports that adult dosage in 12 to 17 uh, that was initially when it came up increases the risk of myocarditis. What is your take on that? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so the, the younger kids do develop antibodies very well. So mm. they need one third of the dose, right? So mm. they get a little 10 microgram dose and it works great. So when you look at studies afterwards and that, like, what are their antibody levels? They're doing wonderfully. They're protected uh, very well from that. The myocarditis is another thing that's commonly brought up and it's certainly concerning. So mm -hmm. there were some reports um, and pretty well um, validated that mm -hmm. some of the uh, males in particular, older teenagers, young right. adults in their 20s, even 30s, um, would get some myocarditis after the vaccine, mm -hmm. not from the illness. So after mm -hmm. the vaccine. So that was like, whoa. So that's really concerning. So mm -hmm. we, but the important part is looking at those details. Um, so when you look at those patients, it was a few hundred patients out of millions mm -hmm. of people who got the vaccine. So it's exceedingly rare. And almost all of those patients, it was very mild, like myocarditis, mm -hmm. which sounds scary, is mm -hmm. inflammation around the heart um, or in the muscle itself. Um, but those those patients, like they have some mild symptoms, like oh, chest pain or their inflammatory markers are a little high, but they're better within a week. Um, of the ones that got sicker and ended up being hospitalized, the average length of stay of hospitalization was two days. I mean, they were in and out of the hospital, no That's big deal. Mm. Yes, myocarditis is very scary. Um, the vaccine associated myocarditis is very mild. They just get better on their own. It's not really a big deal. Mm -hmm. And you compare that to the COVID myocarditis or the COVID long-term problems. If you actually get the illness, and you get sick with it and you have heart problems related to that, or you have long-term breathing problems, or you have that post COVID, like I'm just kind of out of it and foggy and weird. I mean, those things last, mm -hmm. they can last months. Or sometimes we don't even know how long it's going to last. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. those, you look at those, like some very mild possible, super rare myocarditis that resolves on its own versus some of these actual complications from the illness that we see more frequently, mm -hmm. it's clear that the, the vaccine is the better way to go. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you must have heard about this situation or came across the scenario that, you know, a young parent comes in and then says, that, hey, you know what, I don't want to vaccinate my kid. We don't know about the long-term risk of this vaccine. How do you convince or reassure the patient and how will you go about it? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I get that. Um, all the time. Many times every day, and so I <laughs> this question all the time, um, and it's totally valid, right? So this, you exactly. know, the concern mm -hmm. is like, hey, this is brand new. Like, we don't really know what's going to happen in thirty years. Like, right. this is a brand new thing. And what I try and tell people is that in medicine, as you know, everything we do is new. Right. Like mm -hmm. almost everything is brand new. All of those medicines you see on the television, talking about arthritis medicines. Including um, this uh, interview. TI stuff, right? You're using these medicines. These are brand new. Right. Um, they work great. They seem very safe. Um, they have historic precedent. There's other medicines that are like this that we've mm -hmm. used for a long time that seem safe. So there's no reason to believe that they're going to be something totally bizarre, like mm -hmm. you know, some of your medicines that you use for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Like, do you know that is, are they going to grow a horn in 30 years? Like, maybe, I don't know but it's very unlikely and there's no reason to think that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, same thing for COVID. We've been doing vaccines for decades. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just another vaccine. We've been doing this forever. 
there's no reason to believe that it's going and there's no studies or any scientific reason to think it's going to make you grow a horn in 30 years but we don't know for sure um but every we, we do we do know that it prevents the uh, uh, the severe disease maybe that is the patient who have an asthma or an obesity maybe yeah. it will prevent hospitalization we know that for sure yes and those are those are guarantees so these are things that we can measure and see versus like a theoretically maybe possibly i don't know you know so um clearly it, it makes it makes more sense to get the vaccine at this point got it sounds good uh, the other uh, important question that parents have is can i send my kids to school and what are the protective measures that i should take yeah so it's all the stuff that we've been trying to discuss for the last year at least especially with the masks um and those things help uh with all diseases really so you know we've seen a drop uh in the kids when they were separated you have that little mm -hmm. social distance people wearing masks people are washing their hands and using hand sanitizer um, we see a decrease in all of their illnesses so i think that those basic measures really do pay off um, certainly for covid and certainly for other things um, but i think the big message is that we do want parents to send their kids to school mm -hmm. uh, they need to go to school um, there are so many benefits of being in school, just not education, but socially and developmentally and physically and all of those things. We want these kids in school. Um, so, you know, if you take those measures, if you model good behavior, like I have parents that come in like, I hate wearing my mask. Like, OK, well, just, you know, just do it while you're in this closed office with me and mm -hmm. show that your kids that you are OK with that, too. Mm. Um, that will help them prevent illness. And when they're at school, they'll do the same things you do. So if you take your mask off and throw it away every time or blow it over your face every time you get a chance, they're going to do the same thing. And then mm. that puts their higher risk as well. But mm. yeah, we want those kids to go in school. Absolutely. How about kids less than five years of age? What are the stuff that we could do to protect them? Are they OK for play dates with this old micron thing? Uh, yeah, so it, you know, it's a little bit trickier. Um, again, they, they can't get the vaccine yet. Mm -hmm. um, most of the little ones, you can't put them in a mask um, and they put everything they touch in their mouth. So it's like it's really hard to, to work with them. Um, but you do your best. You know, you try and limit these very large groups. You wash their hands really well, especially before they eat something because mm -hmm. you know, they're going to put stuff in their mouth. Like, please just try and clean your hands the best you can. Um, and then, you know, just if you can be around people who are vaccinated, that's that's even less risk. Um, so that that's, you know, worth inquiring as well. Um, but those younger kids, too, they need to be around people. You know, we've had um, kids this last year who are just locked in their, you know, right uh -huh. grandma and parents are working and like their development and their socialization skills and stuff like that uh, take a hit so um, we want them to get out and and be with other children and be with other people got it one last question and your final message to parents between 5 to 11 years of age who are still thinking about vaccinating their kids please um so think hard about it. And we want you to have good information. Um, so it's I, I totally understand um, the parents um, point of view sometimes because they just you just want to do what's best for your kids. Right. Like I want to them to be safe now. I want them to be safe when they grow up. I want them to have like a normal development in life and all that stuff. So I get it. You're just trying to sort through this just avalanche of information and try and make the best decision. So please look at some sites that you feel are trustworthy. So, you know, if you have a good relationship with your pediatrician, please talk to them and um, see what they think about it and see sometimes they can address some of your questions. There are really great sites for parents. I think one that's really good is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. They have one called healthychildren.org mm -hmm. that is actually run by um, pediatricians. Mm -hmm. um, and if you click on that, there's like, there's a ton of information about COVID vaccines, myocarditis question. I mean, all of that stuff is on there. And so you can sort of go through it at your leisure and sort of get a lot of your questions answered. Uh, and then once you feel comfortable doing it, um, just, just go out and get it. You can get it at, there's lots of places that do it. Even for the younger kids, you can get it anywhere. Um, and we're coming up on the holidays. Um, so, uh, we're gonna see a spike. It's, only, you know, everybody's getting back together, which is wonderful. Um, but we're going to see a spike in COVID illness and we don't want your children to get it. 
we also don't want your children to get it and spread it to um, people who are really at high risk of dying from this disease. Um, so, you know, uh, think on it long and hard, but do it quickly. Um, so that we can hopefully, if you're feeling comfortable doing it, we can get more people protected before everybody gathers uh, for the holiday. Sounds good. Super. I don't know how you do your job. I think your job is much, much tougher than uh, me for sure. Uh, my patients are cute. <laughs> your patients, I don't know. Sometimes. <laughs> cute. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's nice talking to you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.